Good morning, Dr. Bill Williams here on the Influencer Podcast, and it's great to see you again. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe. And today I'm going to bring in Brian Beck. He's all the way out in Los Angeles, California. Thanks for waking up early. Our B2B expert on e-commerce at Enceba. Welcome, Brian. Hey, Bill. So great to be here with you. Thanks for having me on your uh, on your podcast. Yeah, what time is it out there on the West Coast? Oh gosh, let's see. It's about eight o'clock uh, Pacific time. So I, I start early. So we we work with companies all over the the planet. <laughs> Sometimes I'm starting at four a.m. depending on what time zone we're talking to. You have an international business. You got to be ready when they're ready. That's right. I do understand that. I was I was up at five thirty this morning. Got a two, three, four mile walk in already. So I'm ready to go. You're ready to go. Let's talk about it. How did it get started? What was the impetus for you to be in this business? Well, it started a long time ago, Bill. I've, you know, I've been in the e-commerce field for about 25 years. Um, I started in the uh, late 1990s uh, when I was a kid, kid out of graduate school and I started uh, working for AT&T uh, way back in the day. And we were building the infrastructure for what was then the internet, which was all dial up internet at the time. So I kind of never looked back. I mean, I didn't I didn't go to school to get into the e-commerce field, but uh, all all through my career now, 25 years later, uh, gosh, maybe more. Um, you miss that uh, e-commerce. I mean, you miss that uh, dial up connection sound, don't you? Waking. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You remember that. I don't. <laughs> but, you know, what's uh, what's fascinating is, you know, today it's, you know, this video with video and and audio and just it's so amazing what we can do now uh you know it, it's unimaginable it was unimaginable 25 years ago uh that, the way that we can collaborate all over the world using these digital tools so and and of course my area has been commerce so the whole aspect of you know shopping online i was on the consumer side for many years and more recently on the b2b side so yeah that's that you know that's that's a snapshot of what i've kind of been through but it's been a great career yeah i'm I'm really glad to see somebody say that back in the old days, 25 years ago, <laughs> makes me feel real good. <laughs> well, my, my first computer was 1981. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I remember when I built, when I was, uh, gosh, I used to, I, I'm not a technical programmer, but when I was a kid, you know, yeah, I, I had a, a Commodore 64 computer and I used to, you know, work on making programs was one of the most fun things I used to do, you know, writing little games and things on my computer. I, I've always been, you know, interested in, in, in the aspect of uh, interaction, you know, using, uh, using uh, digital tools to, to interact and, and to engage, engage with people. So, yeah, I remember, and I remember Bill, my first job, I did, I had a computer, but I had no internet uh, on, on that computer uh, sitting at my desk. These days, I can't imagine, you know, even, getting things done when the internet goes down at my house on occasion it's like what the heck what do i do <laughs> it's you're so tied to it these days right yeah i was discussing with somebody the other day our business in indonesia and different mm -hmm. places around the world and we relied on fax machines yeah and it was like yeah. it was too expensive to make a phone call but you could make a fax that's right <laughs> that's right I was at a, uh, I was uh, facilitating a workshop last week in Atlanta, um, across the, across the country from where I live. But um, we talked about that. We were talking about the evolution of ordering. These were all B two B executives, and you know the word fax machine came up, and we talked about. And it was funny. Some of the, some of the folks, you know, we talked about not even really knowing what it was. Some of our, some of our younger buyers now on the B two B side, and they don't even. They don't even know what a fax machine is, but then some of our traditional businesses are still using fax machines for ordering. So it's it's a whole spectrum and an evolution. Uh, but yeah, fax machines were the were the way to get it done before DocuSign and everything else too, right? <laughs> yeah, and we we certainly don't want to go to memory grab machines. <laughs> yeah, remember? Yep, yep. Palm Pilots. Let's see. Gosh, it's come, we've come so far. Blackberries. Then I had one of those for a long time. You probably had one too. So, and now cell phones, the, uh, you know, the, the smartphones are just incredible. Yeah. Tell me about your um, greatest failure story as you learned along the way, what was the thing you learned and how did you recover? Oh gosh. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I le I've learned a lot of hard lessons um, along the way, Bill, I've, you know, I've got, um, 
in 25 years, I've started businesses that have failed. I've, I've fortunately had some that have succeeded recently in recent years. I've also launched a lot of e-commerce businesses for both established companies and uh, independent. And gosh, there's so many lessons learned. I think, you know, one of the key things is and just it's really just an approach is if you don't know something or if you, you don't have to know everything. Right. And if you don't if you don't know something, it's OK to, to ask questions and not to just barge ahead without having good information. You know, as when I was a young man, I used to make decisions based on gut and based on lack of lack of knowledge and in, in some cases listening to folks they shouldn't have been listening to so one of my key lessons when i talk to somebody who's younger in their career is you know really to just take the time and listen and it's okay not to know all the answers and and particularly as you some of the smartest leaders that i've i've learned from over my career have taught me that um and even observing folks like you know the founder of amazon you know jeff bezos and how he approaches questions and I've been a student of his for years, um, reading books about him and, you know, just the way that that leaders like him approach um, making business decisions. Um, so, you know, and, and having not done that over my career has led to all kinds of interesting things and humbling moments. <laughs> so, you know, I learned the hard way. Right. I've had I, I for example, I had a experience where I bought a software, bought a software. I was a COO of a, an Internet company and fell for kind of the the pitches of the sales team and you know bought a software i didn't do all my research and ended up costing the company a lot of money eventually me my job it was a uh, that was a hard lesson right and so there's um you know listening and really making sure you know what you're uh, you're getting yourself into and not not knowing not needing to know all the answers one of those key life lessons i learned through my career yeah it makes me think of one where I had a choice back in the 1980s, early 80s, to just decide between AT&T and IBM. Uh -huh. And that simple decision to buy the ATT 6300 computer and the AMOS system that it uh -huh. ran under slowed me down for two or three years until wow. I realized that wasn't going anywhere mm -hmm. and IBM was going places. And so I, I didn't mm -hmm. get into the IBM DOS world. Mm -hmm. until two or three years later than I could have. So right. it's, it's always about who you align yourself with, yep. the horse you choose to run the race. And sometimes you don't know the answer, right? I mean, sometimes it's, uh, you know, and, and it's, it, to some degree there's there's calculated risk. But um, you know, the other thing I learned is often you don't have all the information, right? That you can't get 100% of the information to make the decision. And in some of my leadership roles, you have to use, you know, the 80% rule where you've got 80% of the information, you have to make a decision. And often, you know, the other thing I've learned is that, you know, just being nimble and being able to change course along the way is really important as you get data. Uh, that's the way we approach our business today and work with our clients is, you know, it's really based on what are we seeing out of the out of the results, the, the, the data and what that's telling us. And that's the beautiful part about digital commerce and e-commerce field is it's a lot of it is based on, you can get a lot of data out of what you're doing and then make decisions based on that. Absolutely. If you don't have the data, you don't have a business. Right. That's very true. Yep. Not paying enough attention to the P and L things like that. Yep. These are, these are all lessons learned along the way. <laughs> You've seen a lot of people make it and a lot of people fail too. What do you think of the three top reasons you could say some people don't make it in e-commerce? Well, I would say uh, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons. And, you know, my lens these days, Bill, is um, is B2B, right? So when I and let me describe that when B2B is a business selling to another business. Um, and a lot of the folks that I deal with are midsize, in some cases, extremely large companies um, that are you know leading their industries and they've led their industries for many, many years. Um, you know, they've Big companies like, you know, Owens Gorning and 3M and these, you know, really big industry leaders, right? Uh, industrial distributors, people like that. And, you know, when I think about why companies don't succeed, um, you know, around in this area of, of e-commerce, in this area of digital commerce, it's because they get hung up in the things I just described to you, which is indecision, right? They're, the business has been sort of just good enough for years and leadership isn't willing to get uncomfortable. Uh, there's a some degree of lack of, um, I don't say lack of humility in some cases, but lack of, there's almost more of a fear of the unknown, the fear of, you know, hey, I'm my business is doing okay. I don't need to take any risk or invest in areas I'm not fully familiar with. 
And so when I think about businesses that don't succeed, often it's the unwillingness to take a bit of risk. And it's all, it's all measured risk, but it's a, the ability to take a bit of that risk at the leadership level. When they don't succeed, they don't have the leadership uh, behind the effort. Uh, leadership doesn't believe in it. So you can be in a, a middle or even upper management position in one of these companies railing for change and screaming and yelling about it. But, <laughs> but if you don't have the leadership <clears throat> commitment, um, which translates to things like budget, you're not going to succeed. So I think it, to some degree, it's awareness and recognition of where what's happening with, you know, buyers, the younger buyers now, millennials are now in, in buying positions at B2B companies, and they have different expectations than your traditional buyers did. So, <clears throat> you know, those are those are confronting the realities of, of what what's happening. So that's another, you know, the, another big reason is kind of burying your head in the sand and saying, well, my buyers are not going to buy the same way they have for years. And that doesn't that's changed. It, it's not, you know, just look at Amazon and Amazon business and how quickly that has risen as a channel. Thirty five billion dollars in B2B sales last year. Amazon business. It's a significant player now in the market anyway. So there's a couple a couple of reasons for you there, Bill, just from my lens. What what comes to mind is stores I shopped at as a kid. My parents took me to Sears and Roebuck. You're right. It, yep. We went to Woolworths. Uh -huh. We went to even Kmart. Uh huh. Yep. Where are they? Why did they not get into e-commerce? <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned Sears, Bill. I, I, I call Sears uh, the longest liquidation in, in the world's history, uh, longest liquidation sale. They are in my book, uh, which I know you want to talk about a little bit. Um, Sears is one of my case studies. I mentioned them in the first few pages of the book. And I do that because I think they provide a, a really relevant case study to industry as it relates to what I was describing, uh, unwillingness to change myopic viewpoint that they know better than the customer knows. Um, I cite a few examples of that in my book. Where are they? They did invest in you know e-commerce, but not in a way that uh, was significant or really put the customer at the front forefront of what was happening. Um, you know, you could say that the B2C side of, um, you know, uh, the B2C meaning business to consumer side or retail side of the world had an excuse in some ways because, you know, 20 years ago when this e-commerce thing was starting, nobody really knew what, you know, what was going to happen with it. It was it was all brave, new, a brave new world. But when we look at the B2B side of things, right, when we look at the traditional, you know, industrial products or medical products distribution or in these all these there's a lot of parallels between these traditional B2B industries and the consumer retail business. And I say, you know, that and I make this point in my first chapter is there's there's no excuse. You, you've you seen this before. We've seen this before. The retail business has changed dramatically. And if you look at Amazon and other, you know, uh, e-com businesses that have succeeded, it, it's it's on the backs of companies that just didn't get it. They didn't confront the reality of what was happening and they didn't address the customer's needs. Well, someone else did. Same thing is happening in B2B. And that's why I love what I do every day so much is, you know, we're helping companies to address those those issues and confront them and take advantage of the opportunity it creates for them on Amazon and in general in e-commerce. Sounds like a winning statement about failure. People did not see the coming trends. Right. And evaluate them properly. Yes. Uh, it was it was. Uh, old thinking didn't take mm -hmm. into effect what the new crowd wanted, where they, where they were going. They didn't understand it. Maybe they didn't have enough young people in the C-suite. Who knows? Well, I think it's a lot. I mean, part of it is, you know, youth is, youth is great, but it's also, I think, bigger than youth. It's just, and it gets back to what I was saying earlier about just kind of a humility or a lens of not having to know everything, right? And, 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 and setting hubris aside, let's look at what's happening and let's, let's really listen to what the customer is saying. It's about listening. And, you know, I've seen lots of businesses. I have I, one of the first case studies in my book is a company called Petra industries. It's a mid market distributor out of the Midwest and their CEO, um, Bill, his name is um, uh, coincidentally um, had, you know, he confronted these realities 20 years ago. He saw what was happening and he didn't have any experience with this. And he wasn't a 20 year old. He, you know, he, he just said, the world is changing. I'm going to embrace the change. I'm going to get into this, even though I'm completely uncomfortable. I don't know anything about the internet, <laughs> but 
but you know, it's, it's, and he confronted it and he put people in place and today his business is doing well because he got ahead of the curve. There are many, I have a whole slew of case studies in my book talking about this, about companies that, again, taking a more humble approach and really putting the customer first in these efforts, you know, obviously Amazon being the biggest example of that, but there's lots of traditional industries and traditional companies that have taken that approach and frankly today are, are healthier for it and they're taking share from their competitors that haven't invested uh, substantially in, in, in these tools. What motivates you internally to keep pushing the envelope? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, so there's, I, I thrive on sort of this personally thrive on, on the change and evolution and challenge in this field I'm in e-commerce. You know, we, what gets me, really excited is the opportunities that we can create for these companies to watch them evolve to watch them you know kind of embrace this and then the dramatic impact it can have on the value at these businesses and it's and it's about amazon and introducing amazon as a channel for many of them that haven't had it but it's also about really the transformational change e-commerce can have and, and just digital tools can have for these businesses I have this whole model in my book, though, where I talk about the, the what drives value for these companies and its return on investment, right? It's enterprise value. And it's not just about more sales or changes of sales or sales shifting from one channel to another, from you know traditional to digital channels. It's about efficiency. It's about capturing new market share. It's about capturing wallet more wallet share from existing customers. It, the, the enterprise value that can accrue to B2B companies from these digital investments is just enormous. And so what gets me going is, is watching these companies embrace it, understand it. I get so excited when a, you know, when a C-suite gets the, they say, yeah, we're going to do this because, you know, it often starts with Amazon business or Amazon. You know, we're going to do this because we recognize the change. I mean, I have another case study in the book and company uh, out of the Midwest uh, called called Grasshopper Lawnmower. They make these big zero turn lawnmowers. They go 30 miles an hour over the over the grass and such and really cool stuff. The White House uses their their mowers as to mow their lawn. But I mean, third generation family business, right? Mid, mid market company, solid company, well managed. Third generation is coming in, Trent, uh, and they're they're making change. And they started with Amazon, grew that to a viable channel. Now they're introducing e-commerce. Uh, you know, to to their business buyers and, and it's to some to some degree to the end user. These are big changes for a company like that that has dealers all over the world and has sold tr through traditional sales teams forever. Those aren't going away, but this introduces all new ways for them to reach this newer buyer, this younger buyer. Yeah, it certainly makes it challenging for the dealers and distributors out there to navigate e-commerce as a big brother with them. Well, there's, I mean, what you just hit on something really important, which I, again, in, in my book, I have a whole chapter on it. This is about aligning channels and channel conflict. So you think about, you know, if you're a traditional manufacturer, you sold to, you know, distribution dealers, you have a sales team probably. And, you know, the e-commerce channel can be viewed as a threat to those channels, right? It can create channel conflict if not managed carefully. So, um, and you know, this can also start with Amazon, right? Because Amazon is a huge marketplace, it's half of US e-commerce now. So, you know, that managing those channels carefully is really important from a pricing perspective, from a, from a positioning perspective. What we find though, it's fascinating Bill, that, you know, when we do this well, when we do Amazon, when we do e-commerce channels well, it actually uplifts the whole business. So that the value to the distributor, if they're doing something other than just providing a price and a product, in other words, they're adding real value to the end user. It actually helps their business uh, versus when, when a manufacturer goes and, and does e-commerce and Amazon. Where it doesn't help is if the many, if the distributor is doing nothing but taking an order. And so, yes, there's there are traditional businesses that won't be around in ten years in those in those markets because they're not if they're not keeping up with the trends in e-commerce with the, you know the value of you know, the, the bringing value to the customer, they just won't exist anymore. And I make that point in my book too. So it's important to uh, to recognize these things and embrace them and, and cover your flanks if you're a distributor or a dealer too. Get it, get ahead of that. Buy your suppliers, create private labels. There's a whole bunch of <laughs> approaches you can take there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's talk about Inceba just a moment. What's the company's motto? 
saying or our motto is um, thanks for that question. Stand tall in the Amazon. We help our clients stand tall in the Amazon. Our our business name came from the Siba tree, which is the tallest tree in the Amazon rainforest. And we started the business because we were um, we wanted to help branded manufacturers, particularly those on the B2B side of things, to stand out, really to become leaders and take control of what was happening with Amazon, which again, you know, 70% of product search now starting on Amazon, half of e-commerce sales in the United States happening on Amazon, global presence for Amazon, 40% of their sales come from outside the US or well, 35% or so. So, you know, this is a pervasive channel and our business uh, is designed to help those manufacturers take control of Amazon, grow the channel in a, in a, in a manner which does not cause channel conflict which is one of the things that, that many businesses are, are, are concerned about. So that's our motto, Bill, stay, standing tall in the Amazon. We help our clients do it. I can see it. It's a great idea. The, the logo probably is tree line, one big one in the middle. It's a tree. That's right. It's a tree. <laughs> exactly. Well, not to get into the competition, but it doesn't sound like Amazon has a lot of competition. Are there other people doing the same thing that are effective? Great Great, another great question. I mean, the the, the whole notion of Amazon as a um, you know, there's two layers to it, right? Amazon uh, itself has gotten to the scale where where they um, you know they have just massive um, uh, sort of not necessarily control of the e-commerce market, but they have massive um, you know uh, traffic and everything else. But I argue that you know there's a lot of businesses that um, that can and do effectively compete with Amazon. We have this whole swath of new businesses emerging, Bill, that are called vertical marketplaces. And what they do, and this is on the B2B side, what they do is they'll address a specific industry's needs. So they take Amazon's business model and they apply it to, you know, a certain type of product. It might be an industrial product or chemicals or metals or medical equipment or in some cases home accessory products. And they'll, what they'll do is they'll there's one called fair that I often quote, which is in that last industry, home accessories, where they'll go and they'll aggregate all of the suppliers in a, in a certain um, uh, industry. And then they'll go to the uh, buyers of those products. In the case of home accessories, it's a lot of independent retail stores and small chains. And they'll create a marketplace like Amazon does, but the, for that industry. And because they're doing it for an industry, they can arguably do it better than Amazon because Amazon is massive. There's three billion products on Amazon, literally. So, so if we think about, you know, the, the, the ability to more create a more directed or bespoke experience for those buyers based on the product characteristics, these vertical marketplaces can do a better job than Amazon can in many cases. So, yeah, there's competition emerging, but Amazon is a Amazon's got a lot of market share. And so there's you know, they have a lot of power in the market. Um, I don't you know, we can get into whether they should be sued or broken up and kind of fun things like that if you want to, Bill. But. You know, I think the competition is there. It's a robust um, e-commerce is a robust market. And, you know, Amazon's only as good as their the customer experience they deliver, which is why they're always trying to push the needle on that. Speaking of Amazon, you know, and platforms to access the information. Is it is there anything other than the Amazon dot com? An online platform that you go to that you rely on? Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's there's a lot of op, there's a lot of opportunities for so there's kind of we think about it in kind of two layers, right? So you, you know, you've been in, on the marketing side, Bill, right? You think about the marketing funnel at the top. You've got where people look for product, and then you get down to where people buy product. Um, so it's a kind of a funnel. It starts with awareness and goes all the way down to you know kind of the transaction. At the top of the funnel, there are a number of places where people can find product, right? So one obviously is Amazon. But you've also got very significant players like Google, for example, which is a, a place that <clears throat> in my career I've done a lot of advertising and optimization for uh, because it's a, you know, a very significant player in terms of product search. Uh, you've got other search engines and now you have um, social media sites, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, all these other places where, where, where people are living, people are, and people are spending time. And that's sort of top of funnel is getting your products up in those places where there's where there's a consideration of potentially making a purchase. So top of funnel, yes. And then as we get down into the into the funnel, there's also a lot of alternatives people have for buying products. You know, in the B2B side of things, there's distributors, dealers, retailers, 
uh, and that increasingly direct, uh, directly buying from the supplier or manufacturer. Increasingly, we're seeing um, uh, manufacturers uh, offer products directly to sell to the end user. So what you see, this whole value chain, Bill, like, you know, the whole traditional manufacturer makes the product, sell it to the distributor or retailer, and then the end, end user and buyer buys it. That whole clean, simple funnel or transactional journey has been massively disrupted in the last 10, 15 years, certainly in consumer, but now, now in B2B too. So what I, I like to call it the age of, of transparency, right? The customer at the end of the day has more choice more places to go than they ever have before. And that applies to consumers and it certainly now applies to businesses as well. They can find product, they can get it in different ways. They see more, um, you know, product pricing options. Um, you know, the, the, the whole notion of sort of hiding and creating a, you know, kind of a controlled sale uh, is, is, is in many ways gone. You have to recognize that the internet has democratized all of this if you're selling products. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a whole up leveling, I think of the industry. Yeah, going beyond that, you mentioned something about using Google a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing paid digital media to, to connect buyer and seller, are you buying ads on LinkedIn and Google or Facebook as sure. part of your business? So, yeah, for sure. So if you are a um, yes. So these days, findability starts on um, on on the on the Web. Right. So. In fact, really interesting statistic, uh, Bill. I think it was, um, I can't remember the source. It was it was published in Digital Commerce 360. But the fact is that 74% of millennial buyers, right? 74% of those who are now in buying roles for most companies will actively avoid a sales rep. <laughs> so, actively, like not even, you know, just got to run the other way or not, not pick up the phone or not answer emails. They don't want to talk to someone on the sales team. What do they do instead? They go to places like you have here, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn ads. That is the way to stay relevant to these customers. So if you have a, this this means that you also have to have a place to send them. So having a place online, having a, a world-class website or e-commerce presence, if you're, you're selling product, the customers, these customers, these millennials don't want to wait around for a call from a sales rep or you know, to the facts to go through, um, they they want to be able to transact in any way um, possible instantly. Exactly like that. Right. So some of the companies we've worked with over the years, I like to cite this company, Big Ass Fans they are in Lexington, Kentucky. Great, great, great company, great products. Uh, work with them for a number of years on their Amazon program. Their senior management says, I want to be anywhere the customer is and I want to be the represented really well. And that includes Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Amazon. Also, Home Depot and Granger and Lowe's and all these other stores and, and distributors they're in. And they want to be, you know, put their face forward in the best way they can and allow that customer to buy in any channel they want to. They want to buy directly from them. They can. They want to buy on Amazon. They can. They want to buy in Home Depot. They can. Let the channel do its job. Don't try to fight against the channel. Don't fight Amazon. The customer wants to buy there. Let them. They want to buy in Home Depot. Let them. It's the it's that distributor's job or retailer's job to meet that customer's need at that moment. It's not the manufacturer's job. It's the, so in other words, you know, they're, they're staying in front of the customer wherever they are. And that includes the places you just described, you know, in terms of advertising. So absolutely. Paid paid media is, is important. Uh, give us a little hint about revenue. You know, when you're talking about percentage of revenue, people should spend based on your experience. Is there anything that you would promote as a standard amount? There's a percentage of, of spend, yeah, uh, of revenue. So the way, so yes, this has also changed changed over time. And it also, taught this, this this information depends on where you are, kind of my recommendation here, it depends on what your goals are. But in general, you, there is a percentage that you want to allocate of your revenue to digital ad spends. So um, I'll take Amazon first, uh, because it's where we spend a lot of our time these days, um, is in helping companies with this. It can be anywhere, you know, what, when you're mature, you want to be spending three to 5% on your, on Amazon advertising, right? Amazon advertising in that channel directly of total revenue. When you start though, you might be at 15% or 10 or 15, or maybe even 20% when you're starting a program, because you need to build your recognition in the channel, et cetera, in Amazon. 
Now, if I'm looking at this from a from an overall e-commerce budgeting standpoint, I'm saying, gosh, I, I'm not just selling on Amazon. I'm selling everywhere. You know, then the numbers can change. I've seen companies, you know, if you're an earlier stage company that's trying to build brand awareness using Google and Facebook. And I mean, if you think about some of these, what they call digitally native vertical brands, Bill, these are companies that came out of nowhere. You think about uh, Dollar Shave Club, right? Or Bonobo. So these companies that kind of came out of nowhere on the consumer side and blew up, they're spending 40, 50 percent of their revenue on <laughs> on advertising because it's the model. They're venture capital funded. They need to grow quickly and acquire customers. But if you're a mature business, uh, you're not spending anything mm. close to that. You might be spending 10% of your e-commerce revenue on digital advertising. Um, and that's that's pretty generous. But again, this is this is a, you know, a more mature model, more mature business. And that percentage ought to decline because you ought to get more eff effective at it and be able to uh, address your spend where it's most most effective. Now, the one thing I noticed is you're you're talking Amazon. So you're talking physical products almost exclusively. I am. What what happens when you move to the digital world mm -hmm. and there are no physical products to move other than a few electrons through a, a Internet? Yeah. How does so, that change? Sure. Well, I mean, you, you have more margin to work with. Right. So if you're I, and I have done some work with more um, you know, subscription or um, services or um, you know, other SaaS, types of SaaS products. Yeah. Yeah. SaaS software, et cetera. You have those businesses can be enormously profitable. So you can certainly, uh, and I've seen companies do it, increase their advertising percentage to 20, 25%, some cases more, because you simply have more gross margin to deal with. Um, most of my world build to your point is, is more about product, right? So most of the companies I'm working with are focused on product. Although I will tell you that um, a lot of these traditional industries are trying to differentiate themselves based on introducing services. So if we think about, you know, industrial products, for example, you look at the big players there, Fastenal, Motion Industries, Granger, MSC Industrial. These companies have all introduced services to help companies, their clients move or customers move beyond just selling them product, but actually manage their inventory for them, help them with their whole supply chain. And that's where they get sticky. And so when you start talking about digitally selling those services, these companies, these companies don't even look at e-commerce necessarily as a profit center. They use e-commerce as a way to get a customer in and then bring them over to their sales team so they can sell them these services. It's a different business model. Frankly, it's it's good for them because they, you know, they'll get higher value and longer term loyalty by building themselves into their as a solution provider, not just a product seller. So it's fascinating what's happening in that area. So so they'll 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 spend a lot on advertising just to get that lead into the business and then pass it to the sales team. Yeah, it does seem like companies that used to sell computers now do more client services. Yes. Like IBM. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of players that, you know, uh, value added, there's multi-billion dollar, you know, value added resellers in the IT services space. I'm thinking about Insight and uh, CDW and companies like that, that are very large companies now that are effectively distributors. That's how they started. But to your point about IT services, they really, what they're really after is becoming a solution provider to you as an organization, as a business, you know, they'll sell you, you know, a bunch of laptops, but they're actually, they want, they want to get into the managed services. They are in the managed services side of that. So not just the, not just the laptops, but the services to support you as a business using those laptops. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now back to the, um, and Siba and the B2B business, uh, who's your ideal client? Oh, you know, great question. So uh, our ideal customer <clears throat> or client is a mid-sized to very large product manufacturer that differentiates on their product. In other words, that's what that's what's different about them in the business. I mentioned a few of our clients, um, you know, companies like MSA Safety, um, Sloan, which makes uh, bathroom fixtures. These are companies, Zebra Technologies, which makes printers. And so those are some of the larger examples of our clients. But these are companies that are making product and they differentiate themselves based on that product in the market. But they're also trying to figure out how to do all this without causing channel conflict. So they have an established dealer base. They have an established retailer base where, you know, we we don't think about Amazon in a bubble. Amazon exists alongside of all these other channels. We're helping them to navigate that and set up a, you know, uh, set up a uh, path to success. And many of these companies, we've helped them grow very large channels. I mean, some of them are $20 million and more on Amazon, um, but doing it in a way that's not 
that's not going to cause conflict. Uh, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, what our ideal customer looks like. How long does it over a period of time take to grow a company of that size? When you talk about taking on a new client to get yeah. into e-commerce? You know, it really varies um, quite a bit based on the brand strength and what's currently happening. You know, we talk about Amazon as a channel. I mean, we launched one um, major um, uh, manufacturer, a billion dollar company on Amazon five months ago. They're already generating several hundred thousand dollars a month on Amazon in less than six months. So that's an extreme example of one of our fastest growing clients in history, <laughs> but uh, history of our business. More commonly, it takes nine to 24 months to get to some level of meaningful sales on, on the channel. And so I often try to set our expectations of, with our new clients that, it, you know, it takes a little while because we have to earn Amazon's trust. We have to do a lot of things well, including advertising and content and fulfillment, et cetera, in order to succeed. So that, but that's our value is to help our clients do that. Tell me about finding the clients. How do you go about finding them? So I do, you know, I'm fortunate. I do a lot of speaking, uh, facilitation of, of discussions around this stuff. So I'm called on regularly. I probably speak, you know, 30, 40 times a year, if not more, at conferences, at uh, workshops and, and podcasts like this one, Bill. Again, thanks for having me here. Um, and really, it's about education, right? Our, our goal is not to sell you something. Our goal is to educate you. And if we can help you execute, we'll do that. But, you know, because because I wrote this book and because we're, you know, we're a well-known company now on the B2B side of, of, of e-commerce and particularly Amazon, um, you know, clients will come to us and ask us for help around these issues. Uh, and so finding clients is really about thought leadership. And it's funny, I, I advise other companies all the time about, how, you know, if you're going to go out and sell, you know, how do you what's the best way to find new clients? It's really not it's not to sell. It's to it's to help. And go to the pain. Uh, what are the what is the company struggling with? And 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 find a way to help them. And if you truly can do that and do that well, the client base will build itself. Serve the people, and money will come. Yeah, that's well. Yeah, I mean, if you're actually helping um, and adding value, then yes, uh, it, it will, and you can build a viable business uh, around that. What do you do to create the five star client experience once they've got them in your your uh, house in your fence already you you're working with them so what's the secret sauce well the secret sauce is listening uh you know it goes back to the very first thing i said um around you know listening effectively to what your clients are telling you you have to so bill I, you know in my career almost 20 years and being the vp of e-com in some cases the c coo one case the ceo of companies in e-commerce I probably I've probably hired and fired a hundred agencies over my life, right? And we're an agency, right? We we help companies on a services basis work with their you know, their Amazon program, and you know so so when we when we started our company, we said, gosh, we really want to start something that we would want to hire and retain, and a part of that is um, is listening and paying attention to what the client needs. Uh, we also don't have tons of clients, we focus on finding the right clients, companies that can generate at least a few million dollars on Amazon <clears throat> a year. And, um, and we and we work closely with them. So our secret sauce is we really care about the outcomes for our clients. We hire really well. That's another thing that's cri critically important to um, <clears throat> any, any business owner that I talk to. And you've been a business owner, Bill. I'm sure you've seen the same thing, right? Hiring is one of the key things you, you have to do well um, you know, in order to uh, have a have a, a plus client experience is to get the right people in the seats. Right. Yeah. yeah. You talk about having a um, book. I wrote my book of how we succeeded well and create the perfect day. And we just taught our clients, the dentists that we were teaching in our masterminds. We taught them how to repeat having the perfect day every day. Hmm. And it's, and it's really about setting up your five-star client experience for them so it's replicable. So what, you, what are the keys to that, Bill? I'm curious what you what you found in your book there. Yeah, the keys were uh, I did 50 things mm -hmm. that made us successful. And those 50 things kind of fell into five categories. Hmm. Mindset, people, facility, capability, and marketing. Mm -hmm. And once I decided the 10 things that each of those went into, 
five and uh, five categories, 10 things each. Then I broke it down into how to teach somebody how to do each of those 50 things. Wow. And they were able to replicate our um, growth almost exactly. Hmm. And so that's kind of the key is, is teaching somebody from the wisdom of what works. I always hmm. had a say, and if it's been done, it's probably possible. And if you're not listening to the patient, that's one of the first things it starts with is understanding what they want when they come in rather than you thinking you know what they want. Right. Don't be serious. <laughs> right. That's that's a bad problem with medical people. Mm -hmm. They think they know what the people want based on what they see, but they don't listen. Yeah, I'll bet. We come from different industries, but um, it sounds like we have some commonality and in life the lessons and experiences right yeah it's I, I tell b2b companies all the time bill yeah, don't be don't be the sears of b2b you know listen right and that's that's fascinating that um that's what you written about it dovetails well with our conversation today yeah, we had something called a new patient experience where we sat down and talked to them for half an hour before we ever looked in their mouth wow that's awesome so, uh, i really did set the tone up our, up front of what I was interested in and what, what they were interested in. We always had a meeting of the minds. So mindset was number one. Hmm. I always, always enjoy teaching that concept and it, it never failed to amaze people. You would spend a half an hour not charging somebody before you ever talk to them about their, you know, actual needs. Yeah. We, <clears throat> we found success in that as well in terms of same kind of approach, but we're, you know, some folks say, gosh, you, you know, you need to you need to get paid for every every ounce of value. Ed, I don't actually believe that. I think I think when you add value and show that you're a partner up front, um, then, you know, by doing some things for the client, helping them to make their business case or help help them to understand, um, you know, frame the frame the opportunity for them and take some steps and actually add some value up front. Um, that goes a long way and that helps to win clients uh, uh, trust and tr and trust again, as I'm sure you found in your career is a lot of it too, is being able to trust who you're doing business with. That's enormously important. And people, I don't think buy if they don't, if they don't feel that there's some level of trust. Yeah. And the other thing that we did was we, we never prejudged people. We always looked at somebody as a, a human being and saying, you deserve the best and I'm going to offer you the best. And it'd be your job to turn it down rather than my job to figure you can only accept what I think you need. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we created an ideal game plan for every patient. Mm -hmm. And then they chose how far they could go. And we mm -hmm. always had the, the ideal plan was the lifetime plan for those who had to go slow. And so the essential element was everybody got everything that I recommended over 20 years. Wow. Wow. And that was the secret success secret is you stay with it long enough. You know, you keep your recall program, your follow up program intact. Mm -hmm. People will just get everything that they need as long as they can afford it. Right. Yeah, we, we believe in that, too, Bill. We believe in long long term relationships. And we may not we may talk to a company for three or four years before we ever do any business with them. Um being by their side and addressing questions and adding some value along the way. Um, you know, we end up then with a, you know, five year contract with them or we're doing work for the next five years. And so it's, it, I agree with that approach. I think it, I think it's often overlooked uh, by people who provide like us services, um, you know, to, and, and down to an individual patient level, I'm sure in your, in your world. I think a lot of times people have to, in commerce, they have to, run out of one contract before they can start a new one, mm -hmm. but they're looking way before that contract is over. Who's going to be their next person. Right. And, and you would win in the contract business by being ready when they're ready. Right. Yeah. And, and what advice would you give yourself as what's a, that? what advice would you give yourself? If you're looking back, giving your young 20 year old self <laughs> advice, I would, uh, well, yeah, a lot. <laughs> I mean, I think, like many of us, when 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 I was in my twenties, I you know I thought I was the king of the world and I could do no wrong, and so um, I I would uh, try to give myself some uh, some some humility. Uh, you know I, I I joke around that you know it's it takes 
I think it takes a failure or a set of failures to really take a step back and look at yourself and say, gosh, you know, I, I really don't know everything. And so I would probably smack myself around a little bit. I'm from New Jersey. I might beat myself up and say, hey, hey, buddy, you know, get a clue. You're, you don't know everything and, and become a better listener. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about that today, Bill, is that is really being the key to wisdom, the key to, um, in my opinion, and key to success, frankly. If I had learned to listen uh, and listen to, you know, in my 20s, I'd be further, you know, I'd be, I would have started what I'm doing now 10 years prior to when I'm doing it. So, it, you know, and, and had, you know, that much more time and runway and, and all the rest to, to, to grow this thing. But I think, I think so. So giving myself advice on listening uh, would be an and humility would have been the things that I, but, you know, I guess, I guess, Bill, you know, looking back, you know, being headstrong in your twenties, you know, it's, it's almost part of the, <laughs> part of the, part of who people are then. And, and then maybe that's led me to where I am today, which, um, you know, is uh, blessed to have a, a nice, uh, very nice life right now. So, yeah. And I can say that, you know, the 20 year old kids don't listen to us older guys near as much as they should. I always tell people, <laughs> listen to your elders, listen yeah. to the wise people. Yep. The interview I had earlier uh, this week said, don't marry the guy. <laughs> <laughs> she, blurt, she blurted it out immediately. And it's like, that was oh, wow. top of mind. I go, okay, wow. and now let's talk about business. <laughs> <laughs> don't be right. Well, we've, you know, relationship mistakes can be made for for those reasons too. I described not listening. They they can happen. Oh, sure. do you have a living mentor now that's impacted your life? Well, I have. I, I you know, I'm fortunate to have a group of guys that um, you know that I spend time with that uh, you know that I, they're all from all different walks of life that um, you know that mentor me in different areas. Um, uh, everything from business to personal and relationships to spiritual growth, to all all different kinds of things, and. You know, I think um, it's important to have that and, and to surround yourself almost with a team. Um, from a business perspective, I, you know, I, I, I do a lot of reading. I, I love reading about business leaders who have been successful. You know, and obviously, I'm, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a student of Jeff Bezos and what he's built at Amazon. Um, so, you know, he's obviously not a personal mentor with regard to, you know, me calling him up on a Saturday and going to get a beer. But, <laughs> but certainly, you know, learning um, about these folks and, and listening as much as I can. Um, and, you know, just being, you know, to some degree held accountable in my life too, to, to a higher standard. I think those are, those are all things that I try to surround myself with. And so I'm fortunate to have, to have a group like that. Yeah. A group is good. What about, uh, impactfulness? Why is that important to you? Well, impactfulness, I mean, again, that's, that's something that, you know, whether it's impactfulness with, with my, well, in particular with my family, with my son, for example, he's 12 years old making sure that, uh, you know, being impactful in his life and being present in his life is really important to me. Um, you know, in terms of a, a business standpoint, I mean, being impactful for our clients in, and, and having them, you know, recognizing how we're being impactful, but also being open and communicating and transparent with them has been really important uh, in understanding, you know, how we're impacting their, you know, their business. And in some cases, if we don't, if there's something that's not going right, too, that's also important for for us to, um, you know, for us to recognize and and confront and talk through it and and have a plan. So, you know, I think impactfulness is is of course it's important. But in, and you know, I think when you say that word, first thing that comes to mind is you know, my am I meeting my personal responsibilities to my family and my son? Uh, you know, and so I think about that first and foremost, and of course business uh, as well. So. It's good stuff. You know, when I retired, I had a retirement party. Mm -hmm. I had a retirement Christmas party with my staff. I had a retirement party for everybody at a uh, local uh, community center. And then I had retirement parties every day at the office uh -huh. when people came in and I saw them for the last time mm -hmm. in that last year, they knew I was leaving. So this, this one guy had a walking stick that he carried with him. He was elderly, older than me. Mm -hmm. And he, he brought it in and I commented on it, how unique it was. It was not just a stick. It, it had coils around it, rope, mm -hmm. and it thread up and around and tied. And I yep. said, that's unique. What the heck is that about? And then he took it apart and showed me how he used it. It was a, 
a jack of all trades tool wow. that he had created. And he said, would you like one? I, I make these. Wow. And so he gave me a walking stick, oh, cool. which I don't need yet, but hey, I'm ready <laughs> when it comes. <laughs> well, that's impactful. So, that's neat. I was impactful for him, for helping him in his dental work. And he was being, I guess, potentially impactful for me when I need a walking stick. It was beautiful. <laughs> Something to lean on. That's wonderful. Yes. Awesome. When, when it's all said and done, Brian, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, being a, being somebody who is trusted, who was a good partner, um, you know, who was a, but ultimately who, who was a good dad and husband, <laughs> ultimately that's the most sort of important thing to me. Um, you know, just to be, be, be remembered for that mainly and being someone who is honest and, and, and trustworthy and somebody who, from a business perspective, somebody that, uh, you know, was, uh, was good to work with and they, you know, le left them with an impact on their, on their business. Uh, we're not always going to be, you know, enormously successful. I mean, in most cases we are fortunately, but not always. And, you know, in those cases in particular, did we do the right thing? And, uh, you know, did we work with the clients? the way they were supposed to. So from a, from a business legacy standpoint, it's really about that. Um, from a personal standpoint, it's really about just, you know, being, being someone who is, uh, you know, upstanding and with the family and, and just leaving a, leaving a solid, you know, solid uh, part of the society after, after I pass. So, you know, with my son, so that's, that's what I'd like to be remembered for. Establishing and keeping the balance of yeah. life. Yeah, across exactly. the life. Amen. <laughs> I want to um, ask you about how we can support you. And I also want you to talk in this segment about your billion dollar B2B book. Sure. So I, I, um, so I, so I wrote a book called billion dollar B2B e-commerce. That's here. It's a 400 page book. My gosh. I took the size, you know, Bill, I mean, that's you, huge. Yeah. You've written books too. Right. So this is, I, I never thought I'd write a book, but it's a, uh, it was um, I observed an opportunity in the marketplace to help companies. I was getting questions asked these traditional B2B companies. How do I go about digitally enabling my business? And so I had this opportunity to, you know, I had a lot of experience and I had an opportunity to write this, this book. And so it, it came out of a need, right? It came out of the need of the market where there wasn't, I was getting asked these questions. What do I read? And there was nothing to refer people to. It was all consumer e-commerce which isn't really what these businesses needed. They needed a playbook for um, their B2B business, which is different uh, than the consumer side of things. So I wrote, I, I foolishly decided to write a book. It took me four years, it's 400 pages long. I interviewed over, gosh, 150 companies for it. There are dozens of case studies in the book. Um, and so, yeah, and since it published, you know, serendipitously, it was right at the start of COVID. I didn't obviously plan for that to happen, but you know, three years ago, it, it came out and, and uh, it just, you know, a lot of it was helpful for a lot of folks through that time because they couldn't reach their buyers and they needed to find a way to do it. And the book provided them some a path to to approach the channel. So that's why I wrote it. And, you know, fortunate uh, to you know have it now in a lot of hands that uh, companies all over the world that, that that are following its its advice, uh, which is. is it, it, let me ask a question in the middle here. Is this a book for the producer of the product, the end buyer of the product, or the middleman who connects them? Thank you. Good question. It's it's re it's really for the it's for a company who is producing or distributing um, a product. So it's not, it's not for the buyer. It's for those who are trying to sell products, mainly products, but services to some degree too. Products and services to end buyers, B two B buyers. So. It's targeted at mid-sized to large companies, executives, business owners, family businesses. You know, it's like some of the companies that we talked a bit about, Bill. It's the companies like like Grasshopper Lawnmower, but also big companies like folks at you know Granger and Konica Minolta and you know uh, big you know Henkel, big multi-billion-dollar companies where the management there and it's a lot of the senior executives of those kinds of companies have read my book. Um, it's for them, right, to understand how do they transform their business and not be serious. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of our audience happen to be entrepreneurs yeah. who will occupy the space of middlemen. Yep. And they'll have as one of their tools, they'll have uh, e-commerce websites. Yep. 
So is that book helpful for them at all to understand the process? Absolutely. I've gotten a lot of mid family owned businesses, mid sized companies, entrepreneurs, people that are looking to evolve their business or create, you know, e-commerce businesses, even startup businesses have read my book because it, it's helpful for them to understand the whole lay of the land. There's so much opportunity in B2B commerce to involve the, you know, to integrate all the best practices of B2C or consumer e-commerce and go beyond that because it is a different business. But so, yes, this book can be very helpful to entrepreneurs, to mid-sized businesses, to family-owned businesses. I get a lot of calls from, from, you know, kind of folks who have been in the traditional distribution business, for example. A lot of distributors or dealers have read my book, um, and it's helped them to find the right e-commerce platform, to hire the right people. How do you structure your organization? How do you do marketing, digital marketing um, for this, uh, those sorts of things. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's applicable absolutely to, to folks like Sounds that. like a gold mine. And it sounds like you're going to have a, a career worth of explaining that book from the <laughs> stage. Well, I do a lot of that. So, and I appreciate that bill. It's, it's a lot of fun. Tell us up here uh, how we can uh, reach you, how we can get the book, how we can connect yeah. to Ziva. Great. So, um, so the book is available on Amazon on demand, audio, uh, audio version, as well as digital and print uh, in, in uh, you know, paperback form. Amazon.com, just search for a billion dollar B2B e-commerce, billion dollar B2B e-commerce, and that'll get you uh, to the book. You can buy it there. Um, and to reach me, I'd love to hear from you. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, just search my name, Brian Beck, e-commerce, and you will find me there. Uh, so connect with me. Um, I also, um, you, know, you can also email me, Brian at Enciba, E-N-C-E-I-B-A.com, Brian at Enciba.com. And uh, I'd love to talk to you. So we have a free Amazon assessment we offer to companies who are interested in potentially uh, you know, approaching Amazon. I'll tell you how, how big the prize is there for you and what you need to do to go get it. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Everybody that's uh, connected to the industry that wants to get out their product online, see Brian. Nobody Thank does you, it better. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Charlie Simon sang a song just for you. Yeah, well, she, 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 she it wasn't, it wasn't just for me, but yeah, <laughs> she did sing a great song about that. And for James. That's right. James Bond. Mm -hmm. Now, how about your experience on the Influencer podcast? Do you think you influenced a few people today? Well, I, 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 I hope so, Bill, I guess. I mean, if I provided some nuggets of information for folks that, you know, that they didn't know before, that's part of my goal and the way that, uh, you know, I, I hope to help the industry move forward. So my hope is yes. And thank you. It's a great, uh, great format you have here, Bill. I enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, I did. I do think you did about a billion gems. <laughs> Very well done. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to give you the final word before I come back and we'll chat about some more things that I'm doing after you have your final word. Go ahead. Final word is if you're in e the e-commerce field or you're not in the e-commerce field and you have a um, product or service that you're looking to reach business buyers, you really have to engage in e-commerce. It's something that your buyer wants. Your buyers changed. First chapter of my book is the time is now. I say that for a reason. It's because the time is now and the time will pass where it, your window will close eventually. So I encourage you to take action, even if you don't know uh, or unfamiliar. This is unfamiliar area for you. There's an enormous amount of opportunity here. And, and so I encourage you, if you, know, if you haven't uh, already taken, taken some action, dive in. You know, there's resources like my book. There's other resources you can subscribe to online. Don't be afraid of something you don't know. Do a lot of good listening and reading and put some good people by your side to help you who are experts in this. I'm happy to help you if you want to reach out to me, but there's lots of other folks out there too that can help you through this journey. But action, uh, it's, it's time is now. It's time to act on, on e-commerce for your business. Taking action right now is the key word. It's yep. time. It sure is. <laughs> Great message. Great uh, time spent with you today, Brian. We've had Brian Beck and he is uh, expert in what he does. He wrote the book and everybody should get a copy of that book. If you're in e-commerce, there's a Bible 
for every vertical, I think this one might fit the case. Uh, I want to promote to you this QR code up above here, and it's basically the ticket to freedom. Now, there's a lot of ways you can get freedom, but uh, my digital business card gets to me at ovume.com slash on passive. That's where that QR code will go to. And on that QR code, I've got two things I highlight. One is the Influencer Podcast, how you can get to it. That is at drbillwilliams.tv. And the website right now is being updated after getting a virus last weekend. So don't go there today. It'll be back up in a few more days. You're also going to find AI technology at otrim.co. We have a URL shortener that we give away. And that means that if you want to take and make a QR code, you can use our URL shortener and also make the code. All of this we give away for free. And it's a great way to market your business because you can track everything that happens through that short URL code rather than having a long 50 character URL, you get a short one for any part of your website that you want. Not only do we have things like that, but we have the world's best video conferencing software, which is the, the platform called OConnect, just released just about two weeks ago. And it's already the world's best. One of the things, Brian, you'll be interested to note yeah. if you're into e-commerce is we have um, language capability where we can translate to any other language. Wow. That's and if, awesome. you're if you're speaking in English, they can understand you in Spanish, Russian, Chinese all at once. Wow. That's, that's so fascinating. It's going to be the, the going process for business communications as we get more uh, aware, people aware of it. And it's mm -hmm. just a matter of get the marketing done to get it out to the people since it's just been released. Yeah. So we're happy. And uh, I guess the final thing I'll mention is our O tracker is uh, analytics for websites and web traffic. So if you want to track things better, easier, simpler for a lot less money than some of the major packages out there, then look it up. Awesome. Otherwise we are having a good day. It's Monday in Atlanta and uh, influencer podcast has had a winning podcast today. Thank you, Brian, for being such a good coach, uh, a good guest and uh, look forward to seeing more from what you're doing. One of our interests in the future is e-commerce ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, want to read your book and find out what we don't know. Well, thanks again for having me, Bill. I really have enjoyed our conversation. You bet. You guys take care and we'll see you all on the Influencer Podcast coming up on Wednesday.